underground poker games in South Florida, backing arrangements that can't be verified, and high-stakes tournament receipts being faked. A story with twists, turns, a debt revealed, a plan for restoration, a darker end, an alleged seven-figure balance owed to many poker names you've probably heard of. Fake results, fake tournament entries, real victims. Today is the story of Ian O'Hara. He's a person who cannot be trusted. He has no problem lying to people. He stole from us. O'Hara was once a promising young poker player. In fact, he was playing in poker tournaments before the age of 21. One of these tournaments we actually have footage of from several years back. That's right, you know Hera about a decade ago at the age of 19 was already running deep in poker tournaments. He seemed to be a promising upcoming young poker talent. I actually played with Ian on several occasions. In fact, we both went deep in the same Seminole Hard Rock Poker Open event, finishing in the last five tables or so, just a few spots between. I also played in some events with Ian along the way. I forget which ones at this point, but I do know when I saw him, I thought he was going to be a good young poker player that was going to make it in the world of poker and seemed to be a good player when I was at the table. He seemed to play reasonably well, was soft-spoken, and just seemed like a generally nice guy, just maybe a little bit young and didn't know exactly what was going on. Looking at his hand in mob for tournament results, you can see that Ian has played tournaments for a very, very long time, actually dating back to 2012, where he was just 18 years of age. The stakes slowly increased with these couple hundred dollars tournaments turning into several hundred dollar tournaments, turning into thousand dollar tournaments, turning into five and ten thousand dollar tournaments. Ian was making it in the world of poker. In August of 2015, Ian had his first major score, winning $500,000 in one single poker tournament, albeit the buy-in was $25,000. Ian looked like he was ready to take on the poker world. However, behind the scenes, a different story was unfolding. Ian began to run into financial trouble for reasons that remain unclear. It could possibly be that his lifestyle was changing, or maybe it was the fact that poker wasn't going so hot with no high roller caches for quite some time. Or perhaps it was something a little more degen. We don't know exactly where the money went, but we do know in 2017 in some private games in Florida, Ian O'Hara was looking for a stake. Of course, we can't say for sure Ian was doing great because when you see someone cashing in big tournaments, they can of course have a small piece of themselves. However, at this point, Ian now needed someone to take the action. Enter now Jonathan Jaffe as our first victim in the story. Jonathan Jaffe began backing Ian in a 25-50-100 private game when Ian needed backing. Essentially, Jonathan thought that Ian was a good player and seemed that he would be able to beat those games pretty easily, so he took pieces of him in these, in these private games, ranging between 20 and 40% of his action. Game occurred in the Fort Lauderdale area, and Jonathan Jaffe was coaching and taking a piece of Ian. This seemed like an arrangement that would be good for everyone, however, Ian continued to lose. In fact, the losses started to pile up, with Jonathan Jaffe having to pay a significant portion of those losses out, being that he had a piece. Over the next year or two, the losses began to pile up. When Jaffe realized he couldn't take these pieces any longer, Ian had to find a new arrangement. At this point, Ian reached out to upswing poker coach Kane Callis to take some of the action. This is where things began to get a little weird. John and I started to go over numbers of what Ian was reporting to us in terms of his wins and losses in the game. And it turns out that we had different numbers for just about every single session. Ian was just reporting to us fabricated numbers. In 2020, the game moved over to credit, so players would win or lose and have to settle up afterwards. Because of this, there was a written ledger of exactly how much players were winning or losing. Regular in that game kept the records for what players won or lost. Kane and Jonathan went to this player and found out that these results were far different than what Ian had been claiming. They confronted Ian, at which point Ian came clean. Ian was remorseful and promised to pay this money back, but it was confusing as to exactly what Ian owed. He had been skimming off the top and or just outright lying about a lot of these results for a long time now. Exactly how much money was owed, exactly how much money was stolen. It was unclear and no one had real records, so they had to do their best as a group to come to some sort of figure that could be reasonable for what he owed. Because this had happened over such a long period of time, and it was likely that these sort of skimmings were happening quite frequently or even every session, they had to pick a number that made a lot of sense given the pure volume that, that occurred in these games. 
they ended up settling in some region of several hundred thousand to about five hundred thousand dollars the numbers are a little bit contested by both parties ian claims he was never given a final final figure and kane and jonathan claimed that they did give him a final figure but the parties did not work together to reach a mutual conclusion thus there is debate as to the amount owed and this is a number we will never truly get our hands on safe to say however this number was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars because this had been going on for years ian had gone from looking like the quiet nerd to living a more extravagant lifestyle and his look had certainly changed i'm not gonna say anything bad about that though all of our looks changed somewhat anyway at this point jonathan and kane claim that ian came clean seemed remorseful and wanted to make it right they figured out a payment plan that he would be making over some time, and he did go ahead and make payments. For a couple of years, Ian was playing poker and talking with Kane and Jonathan frequently, especially Jonathan, and was making consistent payments back. It seemed like we were on the right trail back to even, and this was all going to work out in the end. Jonathan gave Ian about 60 hours of coaching, and Jonathan and Kane together managed the situation, talking with Ian quite frequently, having spreadsheets to update the debts, and then also talking about what tournaments he would be playing and making a concise plan to try and win back the money that he had lost them. They had action in a variety of games that Ian played over several years, cash games and tournaments, and he did have one big tournament score that managed to pay back a good portion of the debt. This tournament happened in August 2021 with a $440,000 score. Ian was on the up and up, and it looked like everything was going to be just fine. And it was. That's the end of the video, guys. I'll see. No, that's that's actually not what happened. In 2022, the Poker Masters was going on, a big tournament series that happens every year at Poker Go. Ian was playing in some of the events when Kane and Jonathan received texts that Ian was selling for events that he wasn't playing in. At this point, Jonathan and Kane began to follow up, to which they found some disturbing news. Ian claimed to play three events, and these text messages show it clearly. There was a first one where he has a tournament receipt, which includes his name. Jonathan and Kane believed he registered and then unregistered to get the slip. There was a second one with the infamous screenshot of someone else's stack, and then claims four hours later to have busted the event. And then there's a third one with some fake chip updates before claiming he lost. After these events, Kane and Jonathan approached Ian and Ian came clean, saying he should have never done that, essentially, had every intention to play, but he didn't. Sent the money back now, and will never happen to a soul again. To which he consistently re reiterates, he will not do this again. Just personal opinion here for a moment. Pretending to have someone stack to bust so that the people who bought pieces of you lose their money and you keep it. That is a pretty low move. I guess that's kind of obvious, but figure I'd point it out. Kane decided it was time to take this story public. He tweeted about this in October of 2022, scammer alert about Ian O'Hara, over which he discloses most of the story that I told you today, according to his timeline. His starts in 2020 because he joined Jaffe in the arrangement where he was backing Ian. And there were other aspects to the story as well. I'm going to be honest, guys. There are so many parts of this that are smaller where, for example, the action wouldn't add up to 100% because of some reason. Kane talks about that. The conflicting numbers that John and Kane had received. The fact how they figured out that this was a fake story. The confrontation. The amount of money. All of this thing was listed out in this story. They believed he was genuinely remorseful, and when it became clear he was not, they felt like they had to go public. Uh, this is not very serious for a moment here, but I do like Salzburg saying that I would suggest putting him in the super high roller bowl tomorrow. He's a lock. I mean, how else are you going to get unstuck, guys? Just put him in a 300k. What's the worst that could happen? When Kane posted publicly, a lot of different sites picked up the story, including Poker News, who had several quotes about the story, including... According to Kane, he was fabricating data in order to finance his lifestyle. Ian responded publicly saying, I made these choices on my own and I must now face the consequences. I will do everything in my power to rectify the situation as much as possible. I will do better in every aspect of life moving forward. And here's the thing. When someone gets caught in some kind of fraudulent activity, they really only have three options. One, hide. 
That's the most common one. We've seen that lately. Two, lie, where they just pretend that never happened and, or they just say things that aren't true in order to cover it up. Or three, they apologize and try and promise to not do it again. The problem with each of those have flaws. The problem with that last one is that it plays on the heartstrings. You want to believe that people can change and be better. And maybe they will, but more likely they will not. At this point, additional victims came out of the woodwork. OTC trader Big Hooney came forward saying he had been scammed as well. Jack Scheinbacher, between 1 and 200K, and Tyler Ruger, somewhere between 35 and 100,000. Some events Ian would say played three bullets, but he only played one. The total dollar value of all of this together looks to be right around the vicinity of a million dollars. Maybe it's less, maybe it's more. We're never going to know those answers for sure. One particularly crazy detail of this story. While this was going on, Ian O'Hara had a horse. His horse's name was Luke McIntosh. While he was backing Luke McIntosh, Ian would steal from Luke. That's right, the backer stealing money from the horse. I assume this was done via Ian selling pieces of himself to his horse and then faking results. It's kind of ridiculous to even think that that could be a thing. By the way, find a better backer, Luke. You can do better than this, man. There were a variety of other lies in the story, like, for example, Joe McKeon being told by Ian he was square with Kane and Jaffe, which obviously wasn't true. No, Ian and I are not on good terms. I would not recommend doing any business with Ian. And Ian would constantly try to separate the debtors so that they wouldn't know the other people that owed money he owed money to, and it would make it easier to continue the facade. He also told everyone that if you post bad about him, you won't get paid. Let's run through the totals here in this story. In total, Ian did pay back Jaffe and Kane something around $240,000, mainly to Jaffe, but some to Kane as well. He currently owes Jaffe 275k and Kane 200k. A big chunk of what Ian was able to pay back came from liquidating one of his retirement accounts. He also told some people he would be willing to sell his house in order to pay them back to not go public. At this point, Ian has gone more private. He removed or took down some of the tweets from before where he where he was essentially saying that he would try and do better because he didn't want the story to circulate. At least that's what it seems like. And additionally, he has now had his uncle become his front man. Here you have it, guys, the story of Ian O'Hara in its entirety. If anyone else has somehow been wronged by Ian, please come forward so we can get a better picture of what happened. It would not surprise me if there are other victims as well. And also, Ian, if you're watching this, you were, of course, welcome on my podcast whenever you choose to talk about this story and talk about what happened. All right, guys, that's going to be it for me. Thank you for joining today. I uh, will see you again tomorrow. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. Peace.